Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you. Thank you so much, Steve Iadarola, Jeffrey Zilks, Alo, aka Adam L, and two brand new patrons, Aaron and Anders. <laughs> On this episode of DTNS, a presidential campaign gets hacked, and we tell you how, plus tips for telling if that political text is legit, and how to use the PSVR2 without buying the $60 adapter. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, August 12th, 2024. I am in Los Angeles, and I am also Tom Merritt. And I am deep in the heart of Texas, and I am Justin Robert Young. I could be Roger Chang, the show's producer. Probably am. You most likely are, but, you know, I I like your skepticism. Yeah. (laughs) Occam's razor says you're Roger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So does Hanlon's razor. Uh, Today is an experiment. Do not be alarmed. Do not panic. We are doing the stories in a different order than usual just to see how it flows. Uh, we're going to go back to the usual way tomorrow if this upsets you, um, and we'll we'll evaluate this. Uh, but let us know what you think. What, let us know if you like this new way of doing things. Let's start with the big story. U.S. intelligence agencies have prioritized Iran over Russia as the major threat to U.S. election integrity this year. They're both usually the top two, but usually Russia is considered more of a threat. Uh, Saturday, Politico reported, uh, and then President Trump's campaign confirmed to CNN, that foreign sources hostile to the United States had gained unauthorized access to its campaign materials and attempted to share them with the media. Trump says it was Iran. Uh, Politico was sent an anonymous email with internal research about J.D. Vance and Marco Rubio. Now, the campaign says this was all public information anyway, probably one of the reasons Politico didn't run with that as the story. Uh, This comes after Microsoft last week put out a general security warning, and inside of that report was an item that said the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps had tried to gain access to a presidential campaign. I guess we know which one now. Uh, The attempt was made, according to Politico, by a spear phishing email, or maybe this was according to Microsoft, by a spear phishing email sent from a compromised account of a former senior advisor to the campaign. Uh, So what that means is somebody used to be with the campaign, They didn't have their email account secured. Somebody got into it and then targeted someone on the campaign pretending to be that trusted person and said, hey, can you give me access to this thing? I just need the blah, 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 blah. We don't know what the email said, but that's usually how spear phishing works. Uh, Then there was a link in that email that was routed through a domain controlled by the malicious group. And there they were able to collect information. Now, uh, this is the first major hack of the 2024 campaign, Justin, we have had hacks in Mm -hmm. the past. How do you think this one compares? Well, it's less damaging, at least in terms of a media cycle, largely because of what happened in 2016. Well, and the way that the foreign malicious actor is operating. Let's start with that first. If you remember what happened in 2016, where a, link was clicked on by John Podesta of the Hillary Clinton campaign. You had a lot of internal conversations that were then all leaked out in mass through various different uh, uh, third party citizen journalist sites. This was done differently. What was taken from the Trump campaign was then attempted to be laundered via a, a, a pseudonym that's definitely not me, Robert, uh, and uh, they were they were trying to sell these stories to the various uh, reporters. And when the reporters, according to Politico, asked, hey, where'd you get this stuff? The uh, per- source said, you should really not legally ask me that because it would affect whether or not you're able to run it. <laughs> so this was not done in the same explosive manner. And to get to the first point, there wasn't as much to be had because a lot of the private conversations that really got the Hillary Clinton campaign in trouble are now not done via email and are often, according to Politico, done via signal. So there was a little bit less surface area to get, which is why the most that they could was essentially a a publicly sourced oppo document for both Marco Rubio and J.D. Vance. But 
also it was handled in a much different way than the Hillary Clinton campaign had. Yeah. And I imagine that affected the success of it because instead of just publishing a bunch of stuff, and even if it was publicly available, people would have made a big deal out of it, right? You had a journalist in this case, yeah. thankfully, go, well, hold on, where'd you get it? And also, I'm not seeing anything here, but couldn't have found out on my own, uh, which which damps it down. So so the, the attack itself, not very successful. Um, yeah. It does, though, show that there is a continuing effort. Uh, and as the intelligence agencies have apparently, according to the Wall Street Journal, changed their tune, uh, said, Iran is doing it more often. Uh, the, uh, the Russia is still considered to be more adept at this stuff and have more resources, uh, but Iran is more motivated. They're moving from just trying to increase social tension, like having a bot farm, try to inflame people into getting mad on X, to directly trying to influence voters. They're trying to include, uh, apparently they're allegedly funding protests as well as spreading disinformation. Uh, Iran denies all of this, of course, as you would expect they would. Uh, to me, Justin, yeah, this just reminds us that we absolutely need to continue to be vigilant in not falling for that thing we desperately want to be true, right? When we see that post online that's like, ooh, you know that person you hate? Here's an especially juicy reason uh, to continue to hate them or feel better than them because they're embarrassed. Because uh, a lot of the times that stuff is not true and, and is designed to manipulate you. So I'm going to take one abstracted level beyond that. Yes, what you said is absolutely true, but I pay attention to politics more than is healthy for the average human because I cover it. I cover every little bit of a morsel and grain of news that comes out of either of the campaigns and anywhere else around the, the globe that might give myself and therefore the listeners of my show and viewers of my show some kind of edge to understanding what this race is for whatever their aims be. I should not be a model for the average human of how much you follow politics. Mm -hmm. Politics is a battle of persuasion for which either side is trying to remove the humanity of the other side because it makes you less likely to vote for them. Or if you are solidly a partisan on either side of the aisle, it makes a persuadable voter less likely to vote for one or the other. It is when we are worked up into these frenzies that we are the most susceptible to these kinds of disinformation campaigns. And they are often not there on clean partisan lines to have one thing happen. It is most effective when it is there to destabilize. And so I would say for many different reasons, blood pressure, uh, uh, your own ability to focus <laughs> on your own work, this is just yet another reason that, especially in the political world, if you know who you're going to vote for, you don't need to follow this all that much because yeah. there's not a lot that you're going to affect. Uh, if you don't know, keep paying attention, but try to understand that when you are very, very focused and you're very animated about it, if, it, if you're thinking about it quite a bit, then you are susceptible online to these kinds of tactics. Yeah, I, I tend to tell people it's better to pursue information than receive it. Uh, and by that, I mean, yeah. you know, go find out things about the candidates you're interested in. Don't just sit back and watch everything uh, that is trending on threads. <laughs> you know, like uh, that is how you get manipulated. You you let the messengers control what you see. Uh, where you can find better information is when you're like, okay, let me go to their websites. Let me go to uh, an outlet that I trust uh, website. Let me read about it that way. You take the advantage. That's harder though. A lot of people don't want to do that. And it's more entertaining to just sit back and watch the feed, right? Or you can have a hobby. I mean, that's the other thing. Just like, like, <laughs> you can just there's, go there's, outside. There's a lot of, yeah, I mean, and, and I hate to make this into a touch grass situation, sure, but sure. It, it is a little bit. It is, you know, the, the one thing that really, really 
it doesn't frustrate me because, uh, look, quite frankly, I make money on it. So uh, it is, I am a war profiteer when people get really, really dialed into politics. They tend to want to subscribe to podcasts like mine. That being said, I very much care for everybody's mental health. And we have a really intense period coming up uh, after the convention in Chicago. It's going to be Labor Day. And from Labor Day, that is the traditional beginning of the race from then until the beginning of November. It's going to be very intense. There's going to be a couple debates. The world will be watching for your own health. And so you don't become a pawn of either Tehran or Moscow. I would encourage you to, to put whatever uh, interest you have in this election in the proper context. Listen to the fun podcasts like mine, but maybe don't sit on social media and, and hoover up every little bit because the, the, the reality of how these things worked in 2016 were funding of Facebook groups, ads that an AstroTurf Facebook groups that literally just got people out of their homes so they could yell at each other. Yeah, yeah. And and it is not just Russia and Iran. Uh, it's tempting to look at this stuff and say like, oh, this country is trying to get this party to win and this country is, mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't break down that way. What they want is what Justin said earlier. They just want you to be upset. However, that is uh, also uh, it, there's credible information that there are actors in North Korea doing this credible information yep. that there are actors out of China doing this. And so anytime I see something online that is making me emotional and uh, really plays into something I care about, I immediately start to wonder, oh, is that a bot? Like unless it comes from Justin or somebody I know. Yeah. Yeah. Trust uh, me. I mean, Meanwhile, Europe is on the case, uh, Justin. Uh, EU mm -hmm. industry chief Terry Breton sent X a letter on Monday reminding them that they have to comply with the terms of the Digital Services Act, which requires large platforms to be more proactive in avoiding harmful content. Do you know why he sent that letter today? Hmm, I wonder why. I think you know. It's because ex-owner Elon Musk is scheduled to interview U.S. presidential candidate President Donald Trump on X Monday evening. Yeah, so, as he returned to the platform this morning. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's let's go to a related topic here. Uh, last week, Justin talked with the money man Dave Leventhal on politics, politics, politics about money and, and politics in general in this campaign. Uh, but specifically, there was a section where you asked him about how to tell who's yeah. asking you for money in political texts and emails. And he gave some great advice on how to find out, like, if I were to donate, does this actually help my candidate or not? Yeah, this is this is about just ensuring that the dollars that come out of your wallet end up in the bank accounts of the people that you would like to win elections. And so a few things that I want to go over. Number one, just understand that whenever you give your, uh, uh, whenever you give your phone number, to any political organization, just understand that that will likely be sold and resold to cam campaigns for the rest of your natural life uh, until you change phone numbers. So be aware of that in general, although more and more and more outlets require your phone number uh, to, to go forward. So what happens, and the reason why I asked Dave about this is because I'll go on these long walks and I'll be wearing my AirPods and I will hear these text messages that will come in to me. And some of oh, them right, are you've got, you've got Siri reading your text messages. I've got right? Siri yeah. reading my text messages. Yeah. And some I of often them get Weaver sent you a notification that it can't read. So I know what you're talking about. Exactly. And so uh, it'll be bong from possibly from someone from a two, one, two area code. Uh, uh, Kamala will take the white house, but she needs your help. Press one Oh one Oh one to stop or something like that. So, what I wanted to do with Dave and what he walked us through is just to see, because it's hard to tell how many of these text messages are even from the campaigns that they obliquely refer to and if they are not, whether or not they are efficacious. And so here's what he suggested. When you have these text messages, if you really are interested in them, you can click the link. I would encourage you to do it in, in a safe mobile browser. <laughs> yes. Uh, and then scroll down to the bottom of that website. Don't look at what it says it is. Look at what it says in the fine print, because that's what they are legally not allowed to be funny with. From that point, in the example that I went, uh, that I went through on PX3, it was something like the Democratic Victory Pack. 
You then go to FEC.gov, that is the Federal Elections Commission, or another website that does a lot of the organization here is OpenSecrets.org. And that's what we went to is OpenSecrets.org. You search for that pack, and they, on the website, and, and we used Open Secrets, break down how this organization spent that money. In our case, the number one expenditure in this cycle from that specific organization was about $2 million plus going to uncategorized. <laughs> that doesn't sound good. That's a bit of a red flag. And yeah. in fact, we went through all of the different ways that they've spent money. And by the end of it, it was a little over 12% that actually went to contributions to the candidates for which they are raising money on. Now, so if I, sp I gave them a dollar, 12 cents would go to whatever candidate. Exactly. Uh, not a lot. Uh, uh, and certainly not a lot it, compared to you donating directly to the campaign. Now, that's not to say that they are going to spend it any wiser, but at the very least, there is not a middleman between you and the place in which you would like to enrich because you believe that they need to win this election. Does that mean that these are scams? Strictly speaking, no. If they are complying with the law, it essentially just means this is a make busy work organization that are paying themselves so they can run the list so they can run the list so they can pay themselves. Yeah. There are examples of scams that are outside the bounds of the law, but just because this is now a theme for this episode, the reason why that organization had $2 million this cycle alone in uncategorized expenses is because a lot of people who are very, very well-meaning to Democratic causes, click that link before they even thought about it, likely assuming it was going to go to the campaigns directly. And, and that's what I would like to just bump up the digital media literacy of anybody who is interested in donating to campaigns. Yeah, uh, and that, that goes for, for both parties, right? Uh, the, there are people taking advantage of fans of both parties. Uh, so it, it, it don't think that just because uh, Justin used one party as an example that the other party is oh, exempt from trust this, me. right? Yeah. yeah. No, tr this is all happening. And by the way, a lot of them go through the portals that are used by the official campaigns. Uh, on the uh, right side of the aisle, it is win red. On mm -hmm. the left side of the aisle, it is act blue. These platforms do not police for this because a transaction is a transaction is a transaction for them. Yeah. Uh, so you are allowed as a third party organization to run through that payment processor. The only thing that matters is that you are giving money to the right side of the aisle. That's pretty much it. I do believe that on text messages, you are more likely to get someone who is within the bounds of the law even if they're doing what Justin's yes. describing, which is keeping most of the money for themselves. Uh, on email, you should be very careful, like he said, about going to those websites because it may be somebody who's created a fake website and you can't trust it. So you have to be a little more careful when you're talking about email. Uh, but in all cases, be careful and and uh, follow these tips. Uh, you know, figure out where it's actually coming from, the real name, scroll to the bottom uh, and and look it up. Uh, on open secrets or fec.gov um, if, if, if find out who, if what you they're don't spending have, on. If you don't have the patience to check it, you probably shouldn't be donating. D or yeah, you or just ignore it. That would if be the you fastest are, If you're in that big of a rush to throw your money out the door, then yeah. you probably should save it. Save, save the $5 you were going to spend. Yeah. Uh, but again, if you're, if you're curious, open secrets is opensecrets.org mm -hmm. and fec.gov. Here we go. If you have feedback about anything that gets brought up on this show, you can get in touch with us on many social networks. Uh, for example, DTNS show is our handle on X. We are also DTNS show at mstdn.social on the Mastodon Fediverse. We are daily tech news show on TikTok and we are DTNS picks with an X, DTNS PIX on Instagram and on threads. Say hi. Sony now lets you use its PSVR2 headset with a PC if you buy a $60 adapter. CNET Scott Stein points out that eye tracking and foveated rendering don't work. And The Verge's Sean Hollister reported several glitches in using the adapter. I caught up with Sean earlier today to ask him about it. Sean, 
What happened? What happened is I spent eight hours trying to figure out how to get my controllers properly paired to this thing. Because while it does have the video and the power and the data you need to drive the headset, it doesn't have any way to connect you to the Bluetooth part that the controllers require to ah. put your hands into VR space. There was no Bluetooth in mm -hmm. this box. And so, yeah, most of your computers will have Bluetooth. You'll be able to fire up your Intel AX200 built into your PC motherboard and connect to the controllers. But when I did that, I found not only were they a little floaty, but one of them would just go disembodied and hang out in space in front of me or behind me instead of in front of in, instead of between me and the monster that I needed to very, very badly <laughs> shoot with my pistol. Yeah, so, it sounds dangerous. Bit of a problem. Yeah. So so uh, how frequently do you think people would run into this? I think that they will run into it either always or never. And that is the problem with a mm -hmm. piece of gadget that's marketed as plug and play. This just works by our easy to use VR headset. And now you can use it on your PC with wonderful games like Half-Life Alex. If I'm buying an adapter, I expect it to be able to adapt the system properly to my PC. And it doesn't do all of the adapting. It only does the headset part of the adapting, which would be fine if the controllers weren't completely 100% required, but they are. They're required for everything you do with it. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, pretty much. For people who have, I, I tried it with a laptop that did not have enough GPU power. And I was mm -hmm. like, this is not a great experience, but the controllers work here. So that Bluetooth miraculously worked. But this one adapter that I bought um, specifically from Sony's list of adapters that should work with this thing did not work mm. the way I expected it to. I have since tried another adapter since, uh, since I wrote up my story. I've tried another adapter as well. Also didn't work. Uh, that was not on their list, but had a big honking uh, giant antenna on the back of this USB thing. So I figured, oh, yeah, OK, well, we'll make sure that signal isn't the issue. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think signal is the issue. There's there's some ability to keep two controllers paired at the same time that neither of the adapters I've tried nor the one that was built into my motherboard have right now. Mm. Or there's some kind of weird glitch going on that I just don't have more time to figure out than eight hours that's <laughs> yeah that's it and most I'm taking this thing back most people won't uh well sean thank you for for going there so that we don't have to of course uh your mileage may vary out there uh but uh if you want to uh read uh what sean wrote about this we'll have a link in the show notes or just head to the verge.com sean thank you so much thanks take care now, if that doesn't sound fun, there is another option. IGN reports that some folks have had success plugging the PSVR 2 directly into the graphics card with the USB-C cable and installing the PSVR 2 Steam app. IGN says this is probably working on GPUs that have Virtual Link, uh, a USB-C port on some GPUs that was designed to streamline VR headset setup on PCs, and it just never caught on. Virtual Link is no longer added to GPUs, so this will only work on GPUs from around 2018, 2019. If you have a new GPU, it's probably not going to work for you. Uh, but it does seem like it would be a better experience than what Sean had, which I know not every single person is having with that adapter, uh, but I don't think his experience is entirely uh, unusual. Justin, uh, do, you, do you ever play with VR headsets? I don't, I don't get the sense you do. Well, with, with, with an Oculus, but, but uh, I have not plugged one into a PC in, in quite a while. Uh, okay. How do you still use the, the, uh, the quest? Uh, do you play golf with that? Like we used sparingly, to back in the... very yeah, 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 yeah. sparingly these days. All right. Well, PSVR two, very good VR headset, uh, still waiting on that Sony exclusive title that that makes it super exciting to want to get. Uh, but you can plug it into a PC. It does seem like it might be a little buggy if you don't have that virtual link part. All right, let's finish up with a few more news briefs. AMD is releasing patches for a vulnerability called sync close but it will not be patching older models outside the support window. SyncClose is a flaw that could let an attacker run code in the protected system management mode if the attacker can get deep access to a system. So it's mostly a concern for governments and large entities. Meta and Universal Music Publishing Group, a.k.a. UMG, announced a renewed global multi-year agreement that includes Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, Horizon, Threads, and for the first time, WhatsApp, 
Few details were announced other than they will be making artists money and crack down on unauthorized AI generated content, quote unquote. Yeah, at least they didn't get banned like they had to do with TikTok to make a deal, right? Uh, CrowdStrike's president, Michael Sentonis, personally accepted the Pony Award. That's P-W-N, not P-O-N, The where you get pwned uh, at DEF CON for most epic fail. This, of course, awarded for the bug in Falcon sensor that brought down eight and a half million Windows machines worldwide. Sentonis said it is, quote, Super important to own it when doing things horribly wrong. And he said he will display the award at CrowdStrike's office because he wants, and again, I'll quote, every CrowdStriker who comes to work to see it. Good to know he has a sense of humor about it. Yeah. And Multiple U.S. agents. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple U.S. agencies have launched the Time is Money initiative meant to make it easier for you to un unsubscribe from things. These include the FEC investigating requiring as it will as it will be as easy to cancel as it is to subscribe to a communication service. The FTC's click to cancel rule proposal and requirements will make it easier to interact with healthcare companies. Yes, please do that. Uh, just just do it anyway. Don't wait for the government to make you do it. Uh, and Poly Market, uh, if you haven't heard of it, is a prediction market. Uh, well, these prediction markets let you place bets on all kinds of things, not just sports games, but current events, elections, etc. It has partnered with Perplexity, which uses large language models to enhance its search results. Poly Market will include Perplexity's generated summaries on its events pages. And perplexity will include polymarket's data in some of its results. AI Polymarket helping sponsored a bar right across the street from the RNC. Oh, did it? Do you think mm -hmm. they'll be at the DNC? We'll have to find out. We'll have to find out indeed. All right, before we get out of here, let's check out the mailbag. Uh, we got an anonymous email that I have verified the person knows what they're talking about. We've had a, a few more email exchanges, but they wished to remain anonymous. Uh, right. Hello, DTNS crew. I wanted to share my thoughts on Archer's plan to offer commercial services for the Los Angeles Olympics. I am an engineer at a large helicopter manufacturer, and I do not see any way that they will be able to offer service in time for the 2028 Olympics. My company has decades of experience bringing a helicopter through certification with the FAA, and I don't think we would be able to bring an aircraft or Archer's maturity into service in time for the Olympics. EV tolls, uh, electric vertical and takeoff and landing uh, aircraft, are a brand new type of aircraft, so the current regulations will be harder to navigate since they were not written with this type of aircraft in mind. Finally, I think the current issues seen with some of the aircraft manufacturers, <laughs> I think I know what he's talking about, will make the FAA become even more strict, further delaying their rollout. And he thinks that investors are possibly going to get frustrated with this company, Justin. Mm, yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Although there's uh, obviously so much excitement for the LA Olympics after Tom Cruise jumped out of, uh, jumped off a stadium. To secure the pros the, the prospect of Snoop and Dre at the opening ceremonies after their their play on Venice Beach too kind of got me excited. I mean, it's it's going to be it's going to be pretty epic, and also uh, everything won't be early in the day, so we can watch it at normal times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I will not be able to go anywhere because I live in Los Angeles, but everyone else will have a good time. Here's my here's my idea, Justin. Okay, the, go ahead. The, apparently. The recommendation from the organizers of the Paris Olympics to the Los Angeles Olympics was, do you? That's what we did. We were very French when we did our Olympics. You should be very Los Angeles. So we're off to a good start, having Tom Cruise abseil into the yep. stadium. Uh, I think Paris, they said, you know what? Let's do something different with the athletes coming in on the Seine on boats. Yeah. L.A., low riders down Van Nuys Boulevard. Oh man, there's a lot, a lot of, a lot of jokes. None of which I think are safe for uh, the audience of DTNS. But I'm glad that finally the authenticity, the legendary authenticity of Los Angeles, will be on display <laughs> for the rest of the world. Let's see the real LA. Uh, thank you, Justin Robert Young. Where can people find more of what you're doing these days? Well, you know, I have a panel show called We're Not Wrong, and it is uh, myself, Jen Briney, and Andrew Heaton this Sunday. In Chicago, we will be doing a live show. You can find a ticket link 
on my Twitter account. It is at the Greenhouse Theater. You can also just Google that. But I have been teasing for weeks that there is a special guest because there is a, a slim chance, although it looks like unlikely now, that I would be unable to make it because my wife is pregnant in her third trimester. So one way or another, the special guest is going to be there. And I will tell you, the DTNS audience, for the first time, the special guest is Tom Merritt, making his debut on We're Not Wrong. So come see myself, Jen Briney, and Andrew Eaton, joined for the first time ever on stage, Tom Merritt, live We're Not Wrong. It's going to be great to be on stage with you, buddy. Man, I'm excited. Uh, I am. I am looking forward to, to showing up. I'm a huge fan of We're Not Wrong, uh, and I and I I hope I can live up to my own personal idealization of what that show is. This uh, I think I'm going to make you do fun. the run sheet. I think I'm going to make you do the run sheet. <laughs> of course you are. Yeah. I'm going to make you do you? the run sheet. <laughs> you know, because you might have to leave at any time. So I it's might. Probably a, I, know. Yeah, I mean, like, literally, idea. that was the reason why I wanted you there is because there was only one person I trusted to do the run sheet. <laughs> uh, well, folks, uh, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. If you're a patron, you get more. And we are going to talk about e-voting, a dream for one company but they are pursuing it what I think is the right way, letting hackers at DEF CON find the vulnerabilities in it. Justin and I are going to talk about whether we think we will ever see online voting in the United States. You can catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back tomorrow with updates from Google's Pixel 9 event. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>